Now I'm a severed head in a fridge. Sucks to be me, Jerry. Why do so many stories still stuff women inside refrigerators? The woman in a refrigerator trope is when a female character is killed or hurt in order to motivate a male character's story. The name was coined by writer Gail Simone, inspired by the 1994 comic Green Lantern No. 54, where the hero's girlfriend Alexandra DeWitt is, sure enough, murdered and stuffed inside his refrigerator. Looking at the many examples across film, TV, and comics, we can spot some recurring patterns in the fridged woman. She's often killed near the start of the story, and this hair Harrowing event is the motivating incident for a male hero to go on a narrative journey. Husband to a murdered wife, and I will have my vengeance in this life or the next. She can also arrive pre-fridged, dying before the story begins and driving it without ever having to be physically present. My wife deserves vengeance. If she's not killed, the fridged woman might be the victim of severe violence, often including sexual assault. The fridging event might be presented as a direct result of the hero's failure to protect her, framed as a kind of failure of masculinity. Should I bring this on her? And in many cases, her death or suffering will be the price for unlocking our hero's god mode, enabling him to become a more powerful, complete version of himself. Frequently, we know little to nothing about the fridged woman as an individual. In her classic form, she's just there to be a symbol, often of lost innocence, purity, or everything good that's been taken from the male character. What was she like in real life? She was lovely. The fundamental problem with putting women in refrigerators is that it's a way of sidelining female characters, reducing them to one-dimensional objects in a story that's all about the men. The question of what exactly constitutes a fridging can get complicated. Does it still count if the woman is well drawn before she dies? If male characters get injured or killed too? Or if there are other complex female characters in the story? These answers aren't always clear cut. Ultimately though, the fridged woman trope is most useful not as a way to condemn individual stories, but as a touchstone for opening up important discussions about how women are represented on screen. Whatever he does to you, don't scream. She'll scream and you're gonna die knowing that it's all your fault. Here's our take on why this trope remains so common and how we can bring this simplistic fridged woman out of the kitchen for good. What's the last thing that you do remember? My wife. That's sweet. Dying. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe and click the bell to get notified about all our new videos. This video is brought to you by Skillshare, an online learning community where millions of people come together to take classes that fuel their creative journey. If you're one of the first 1,000 people to click the link in the description below, you'll get two free months of Skillshare Premium. So become a member today and start exploring your creativity for less than $10 a month. Your women characters are awful. None of them have anything to say for themselves. And most of them get either shot or stabbed to death within five minutes. Green Lantern's girlfriend in the fridge may sound like an incredibly specific incident to make a whole trope out of, but Gail Simone was quick to point out that the general tendency to use the grisly death of female characters to motivate a hero is strangely ubiquitous in comics. Simone and her colleagues created a Women in Refrigerators website featuring an extensive list of these incidents to drive home the point that being a girl superhero meant inevitably being killed, maimed, or depowered. More than 20 years later, countless superhero stories on the big screen still feature spandex-clad men grieving the loss of a beloved female. There's only one person in this world that I care about, and she's gone. Long before the trope had a name, it was a common practice in all kinds of story genres. They killed my wife. Epics like Braveheart and Gladiator derive much of their emotional impact from launching the hero's story with a savagely killed wife. They killed her to get to me. The James Bond franchise not only contains a number of disposable Bond girls, it also uses the death of Bond's wife Tracy to justify his later womanizing. Many lady friends, but married only once. Wife killed. All right, you've made your point. You're sensitive, Mr. Bond. 
About certain things, yes. Knowing about the loss in Bond's early story, the audience might excuse his sleeping with so many women without forming an emotional attachment as the behavior of a man who's still, at his core, heartbroken. What if you find forgiveness in the arms of all those willing women for all the dead ones you failed to protect? Director Christopher Nolan's leading men range from billionaire vigilantes and dream burglars to old-timey magicians and amnesiac detectives. But what ties many of them together is that behind this hero lies a very dead woman. She might be dead from the start and represent the driving mystery at the center of the narrative. You told me you were looking for the guy who killed your wife? Her tragic demise might be the story's inciting incident, or the formative moment when the hero realizes who he is. Rachel believed in what you stood for, what we stand for. Or her memory might still show up to haunt the hero's subconscious. You're just a shade of my real wife. I'm sorry, you're just not good enough. TV tropes termed this variation on the fridged woman, who appears in the story either as a literal ghost or as a figurative one, visiting the hero through visions or agonized flashbacks, the lost Lenore, after the woman mourned in Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven. I'm asking you to take a leap of faith. It's easy to see why a filmmaker like Nolan finds the fridging device to be such an efficient and effective emotional shorthand. Killing off a loved one is a quick way to advance the story, add gravity to the events we're watching, and present the hero as a tortured soul, worthy of the audience's sympathy. But somehow I just... I just know she's never gonna come back to bed. As George Lucas once said, emotionally involving the audience is easy. Anybody can do it blindfolded. Get a little kitten and have some guy wring its neck. The John Wick series shows this quite literally by kickstarting its story through fridging an innocent animal, albeit a puppy rather than a kitten. The effectiveness of using his dog's death to motivate John Wick's story reveals a lot about how the fridging technique operates. When Ellen died, I lost everything until that dog arrived on my doorstep. For a revenge narrative like this, the death acts as our buy-in moment. It sets up our desire for a biblical eye-for-an-eye style justice, the visceral satisfaction of seeing someone punished, probably violently, for their transgression. But it's worth noting that the death of a human character should function differently from that of an animal. As standout books Robert Wood writes, observing that Wick is also motivated by his car being taken, quote, when a role traditionally taken by a woman can be filled by a car or pet, that woman wasn't really being treated as a human. <laughs> As Wood points out, much of the time, the fridged woman is used like a MacGuffin, an object that motivates the character but whose specific nature doesn't matter. The fridged woman trope often seems to operate according to the logic that the less we know about her, the better. Thus, this person is reduced to an object. It can even feel like the fridging incident is, in Wood's words, damage done to his property. The John Wick series gives the dog's death extra significance by making the animal a gift from John's dead wife and taking time to build a meaningful relationship between John and the animal. But the sad truth is that some fridged women don't even get the same level of development as John Wick's puppy. So essentially, much of the time, the biggest problem with the fridged woman is bad writing. I can't believe Vanessa, my bride, was a fembot. In a sitcom spin on the trope, How I Met Your Mother used its mysterious titular mother as the motivation for Ted's long, rambling story of searching for love in the modern world. Kids? I'm going to tell you an incredible story. The story of how I met your mother. But after waiting until its very last season to introduce the mother as a real character rather than an idealized specter, the show speedily killed her off with cancer in the finale. So all of Ted's ruminations on his dead wife ultimately proved just a narrative ploy to build his final grand gesture towards someone else. You made to sit down and listen to the story about how you met mom? Yet mom is hardly in the story. And the vocal fan outcry over this choice highlighted how audiences frequently feel shortchanged by the cheap, cliched trick of using a dead woman merely as a plot device. John Wick's audience not only found the death of the puppy to be an emotionally effective motivator, many also on some level seemed to appreciate simply that for once it wasn't a woman being killed. Sure, fridging works, but if you avoid the cliched choice to objectify a woman in the process, it can actually work better.
Naturally, the women in refrigerators debate was soon met with the response that it's not only female characters who come to nasty ends or endure brutal violence, especially in superhero comics and other action-packed stories that thrive on over-the-top conflict. Comics critic Heidi McDonald stated, If you composed a list of male superheroes who had been killed, maimed, or otherwise dispossessed, it would be just as long. So simple. Even a blind man could see it. But in response to the criticism that, quote, damn it, men suffer too, editor John Bartol and the Women in Refrigerators team created a second list for a counter trope they called Dead Men Defrosting. Bartol argued that while it's true that male heroes are frequently attacked, injured, or maimed, the effects are rarely permanent or irrevocably disempowering. Superman dies but is resurrected. He's back. Thor loses an eye, Luke Skywalker loses a hand, and Tony Stark gets a chest full of shrapnel, but each of them comes back at least as powerful as they were before. And crucially, their pain isn't designed to motivate anyone else, but to provide the sort of adversity which the hero himself must overcome to be worthy of his goal. Why do we fall so, so that we can learn to pick ourselves up? In the rare instance when a male hero is actually killed, his agency tends to remain fully intact as he gets to make his death count and achieve a final victory for his beliefs. I am Iron Man. The Batman universe offers a clear example of how these differences play out. Both Bruce Wayne and Barbara Gordon suffer spinal damage in The Dark Knight Rises and The Killing Joke, respectively. However, while Batman is able to make a full recovery thanks to a little makeshift chiropractor treatment, Batgirl is left permanently paralyzed. It really is a shame you'll miss your father's debut, Miss Gordon. Our venue wasn't built with the disabled in mind. Most importantly, Batman's injury occurs so that he can overcome it to rise up and save the day. You don't owe these people anymore. You've given them everything. Not everything. Not yet. But Batgirl's suffering is inflicted by the Joker in an attempt to drive her father insane. I spoke with Commissioner Gordon before I came in here. He told me he wanted this done by the book. Despite all your sick, cruel, vicious little games, he's as sane as he ever was. There's also a fundamental difference in the nature of violence inflicted on female characters. And your wife moaned like a whore when they ravaged her again and again. As comics editor Joan Hilty pointed out, it's not just how often it's done, it's how it's done and to whom certain things are done. The sexually violent visual language of how these women get killed is remarkably consistent. By using sexual violence against women or the threat of it to motivate male characters, stories reinforce the regressive idea that a woman's value is tied to sexual purity, while a man's is comprised of his capacity to violently protect that purity. Where is my daughter? Still keep your sense. Sell them. You sold my daughter. Undoubtedly, the sight of harm coming to someone innocent provokes a strong feeling in a viewer. Yet, as John Wick proves, using an animal for this purpose actually makes much more sense. Because you can't let the animals die in the movie, just the women. Lumping women in with animals and children in this way implicitly harks back to a view of females as simple, virtuous, helpless creatures. Hadn't we better get the women and children into the boat, sir? In fact, the woman in the refrigerator can be seen as evolving out of the damsel in distress. A woman who's stripped of her agency and put in danger as a prize for the hero to rescue through his bravery and skill. The Taken series demonstrates how intertwined these two tropes are by using them relatively interchangeably. The first film sees Brian Mills chasing after a damsel in distress when his daughter is kidnapped. After the series basically rehashes this premise in the follow-up, the third entry kills off his ex-wife while on some level implying that she ends up dead for making the mistake of being with another man instead of with the hero. But whether they're dead or taken, the female characters function as little more than a pretext for Brian to begin his latest rampage. But what I do have are a very particular set of skills. 
The problems with The Fridged Woman also apply to similar tropes like Black Dude Dies First and Bury Your Gaze, which treat people of color or LGBTQ characters as expendable in stories starring straight white protagonists. I seen this movie, The Black Dude Dies First. And arguably, some of the most hated fridging moments in recent years do center on race or sexuality as much or more than gender. Ultimately, the point of calling out women in refrigerators isn't about taking offense to particular stories in which bad things happen to women, but about drawing attention to the sheer number of stories in which women exist only for bad things to happen to them. Much like the Bechdel test, which asks if a story includes at least two women who talk to each other about something other than a man, the fridged woman trope wasn't designed to be an all-encompassing measure of a story's feminist credentials. It's there to spark conversation about how female characters tend to be written. After Deadpool 2 got negative reactions for arguably fridging Deadpool's girlfriend Vanessa, Gail Simone herself weighed in that, in her view, it wasn't a fridging because Vanessa was a well-rounded character in the first film and continues to appear in Deadpool 2 as a lost Lenore figure. It's okay. There's a time for us. It's just not now. Others counter it's a textbook fridging example, reducing the woman to a sidelined symbol of lost goodness to motivate Deadpool, while the fact that she's magically resurrected in a mid credit scene after the movie has ended only makes it worse that she's left out of the whole story for no real purpose. Yet the debate around this example illuminates that there are many more instances where the question of what's really fridging gets very murky. For example, what if there are also plenty of men dying as motivation so that the hero can rise up as a deeper, more complete version of themselves? Over here, Uncle Ben. In Game of Thrones, the death of a woman, Egret, does motivate male character Jon Snow, but the death of male character Khal Drogo is used exactly the same way to motivate a female, Daenerys. Or what if a woman is killed off in a story where there's a female hero, or plenty of other well-drawn female characters in the mix? Jen Garner in Alias, her fiancé got fridged. To me, what that says isn't, um, why are you killing the loved one of that main character? Um, it's, there's not enough female protagonists in storytelling. That's mm -hmm. what it's about. What if the killed woman has agency? In Avengers Endgame, Black Widow does die to save a man, but she chooses to sacrifice herself. I tell my family I love them. So is her death fundamentally different from Tony Stark's heroic self-sacrifice? Moreover, is a female death that motivates a man really still a fridging if she's given ample pre-fridge screen time and characterization? In Seven, Gwyneth Paltrow's Tracy is killed explicitly in order to test Brad Pitt's David. I took a souvenir. Her pretty head. Yet this is the climax, near the end of the movie, when we have very little time left with any of the characters. When Avengers Infinity War's Gamora is killed by her adoptive father Thanos. This doesn't sit right with many viewers, because it's clearly sacrificing her to serve his story. I ignored my destiny once. I cannot do that again. Even for you. But of course, her character's been fleshed out over multiple movies, and due to the magic of time travel and alternate timelines, she'll eventually come back in another form. On Breaking Bad, both Jane and Andrea die in terrible ways to shape Jesse and Walt's character arcs. But especially with Jane, the fact that we've gotten to know her well and see her special relationship with Jesse is precisely what makes her death gut-wrenching. Have you been to the George O'Keefe Museum? Is it the, uh, one with the A-bombs? So counter to the fridged woman cliché that the less we know is better, examples like these illustrate how killing a three-dimensional character resonates far more, because we have the sense of a fully formed person we care about having been destroyed. It's striking that when films or shows go out of their way to subvert or complicate the fridging trope, You thought I loved Rebecca? You thought that? I hated her. The result is usually better drama and greater emotional impact. The Lannisters send their regards. <laughs> we might never move away from using character deaths to gut punch the audience and drive stories. It's just too effective. 
but we can hope to leave behind lazy, derivative versions of this which assume women or other marginalized groups are only there as accessories to a white male story. What really keeps us watching is a new twist on the same old story, something we haven't seen before. Can you tell a story, Bob? Can you make us laugh? Can you make us cry? Can you make us want to break out? Enjoy a song. Hi everyone, I'm Susanna. I'm Deborah, And we're the creators of The Take. Please subscribe and tell us what you want our take on next. This video is brought to you by Skillshare, an online learning community that offers affordable classes designed to fit your schedule and skill level. When you join Skillshare, you'll get access to thousands of workshops taught by amazing professionals, and you'll receive feedback and encouragement from your fellow creatives. One Skillshare original you can check out right now is Robert Generate III's class on how to create your own coloring book. The award-winning illustrator will walk you through a step-by-step -step guide on how to improve your layout and line work using your iPad. Right now, Skillshare is offering our viewers two months access to all their classes for free. But that's only if you're one of the first 1,000 people to click the link in the description below. So join today and jumpstart your creative journey.